Uh, good morning uh, and good evening, as well as good uh, afternoon for folks, depending on where you are joining us. Thank you for joining this panel on what's happening within the PLA. I'm Bonnie Lin, Director of the China Power Project and Senior Fellow for Asian Security at CSIS, and I will be moderating this panel. So this panel will focus on uh, what's happening within the PLA, as well as explaining what are some of the surprising occurrences that we've seen the past couple of months. This includes, for example, <clears throat> first the disappearance and then the removal of China's Defense Le uh, Minister Li Shangfu, the removal of top generals from China's PLA rocket force, as well as the unsubstantial reporting about a deadly accident in involving a PLA Navy nuclear powered submarine. Also, earlier this month, the Department of Defense released its annual China military power report that highlighted a variety of developments within the PLA, as well as a range of PLA activities, including a large number of risky, uh, coercive and risky uh, PLA air intercepts against U.S. and allied partner aircraft. We also know that this week, China held its Shangshan Forum, but without a PRC defense minister and with the Russian defense minister present. Uh, at this forum, uh, China's vice chairman of the Central Military Commission, uh, General Zhang Yuxia, explicitly warned that China will not allow and show no, will show no mercy against any attempt to split Taiwan from China. So given all these developments, both at the leadership level, uh, as well as increased at different PLA activities, as well as China's recent Shangshan Forum, there is a lot to discuss. And I'm very delighted to have three top experts joining us from the United States and Taiwan. Uh, and I will introduce them in the order that they will speak. So first, speaking first, will be Dr. Joel Wasnow. He is a senior research fellow at the Center for Study of Chinese Military Affairs within the Institute for National Strategic Studies at the National Defense University. He also serves as an adjunct professor at the Edmund A. Walsh School of Foreign Service at Georgetown University. Prior to joining NDU, Dr. Wuthnow was a China an analyst at the Center for Naval Analysis. Following Joel would be, will be Dr. Shen Mingshi. He is currently a research fellow and director <clears throat> of the Division of National Security Research and acting deputy chief executive officer at the Institute for National Defense and Security Research in Taiwan. Previously, Dr. Shen served in the Republic of China Army for 36 years and retired at the rank of colonel. Last but not least, we will have uh, Mr. Rod Lee. He is currently the director of research at the Air University's China Aerospace Studies Institute, where he oversees research on Chinese military aerospace forces and the Chinese civilian aerospace sector as it relates to the military. Prior to his time at Cassie, he served as an analyst within the U.S. Navy covering Chinese naval forces. So, Joel, uh, Mingxi, and Ra, thank you for joining us today. So, Joel, let me turn to you first to get your thoughts on what you've seen as the most significant developments within the PLA in the last year. And related to that, are you seeing, is the PLA more capable now than a year ago? And in what areas has the PLA significantly proved its capability? And one other thing, Joel, before I turn to you, I forgot to mention for the audience, we'll have each of the panelists speak, and then we will uh, take a Q&A afterwards. And when we take Q&A, you can type your questions into the Q&A function um, in the in the chat and we all the panelists will be able to see those questions but you can type them anytime you don't have to wait until the Q&A portion so sorry about that Joel over to you great thanks so much uh, Bonnie good morning uh, to everyone um, and so it's a good question I'm going to kind of address this um, mostly with reference to the China military power uh, report which was uh, just recently released and it's very comprehensive um, once again a pretty solid um, report from the Office of the Secretary of Defense that gives a pretty wide-ranging survey of recent developments uh, with the PLA. Um, we nitpick sometimes there are mistakes. The data cutoff, it tends to be uh, at the previous year. So if it's in October, some of the data is slightly out of date, um, but overall pretty solid wide-ranging report. Um, you know, so I think, you know, first of all, I would say on the conventional side of the PLA, um, a lot of progress certainly was made um, in 2022 across all of the services. Um, if we look at the Navy, uh, for example, they're up 30 ships uh, compared to the previous estimate. Um, if you look at the Air Force, they're up uh, several hundred fourth or fifth generation um, fighters, current, according to the DOD estimates. 
in some specific uh, classes or categories, you see notable firsts or precedents. Uh, for example, you saw the sea trials uh, just recently beginning for the Fujian um, aircraft carrier. I think the report actually did a pretty good job this year on another area, which is uh, Chinese special operations uh, capabilities. In past reports, they barely covered it. Uh, here you have several pages on improvements um, in Chinese soft uh, capabilities. Um, another area where you saw improvements was in terms of better integrating civilian uh, capabilities into the PLA. Um, and so there was quite an extensive discussion in this year's report looking at um, the participation of civilian roll-on, roll-off ships into amphibious uh, training exercises um, off the east coast of China. Um, so pretty important stuff. On the nuclear side, um, you see new projections um, of an accelerating, expanding, and diversifying nuclear arsenal uh, for China. Um, you saw in 2022, last year's report, um, you know, sort of the idea of maybe about a thousand uh, nuclear warheads by 2030. Um, here, the projection is updated to um, more than a thousand. Um, the current stockpile updated from maybe about 400 to maybe a bit more than 500 or so. Um, also updated information and data on space and counter space uh, capabilities. You know, I think what really ties all this together and of you know greater note, greater uh, greater interest um, is the concept of what the Chinese call integrated strategic deterrence. Um, you saw this phrase being used by Xi Jinping at the 20th Party Congress about a year ago. Really, what he's talking about is building you know sort of asymmetric uh, strategic level capabilities uh, for the purpose of deterrence. Um, so the nuclear expansion fits into this. Some of the important conventional pieces fit into it as well, including the revelation in this year's report that the PLA is interested in a conventional tipped um, ICBM uh, range uh, ballistic missile as well. Um, you know, so this is all, you know, very important. One thing when, you know, readers, you know, you look through the, the China military power report, a lot of the content is very standard, but at the end of the report, you often see a number of special sections. Um, these are not mandated or required by Congress. This is really um, up to the DOD to determine um, special areas where they want to dive into um, unique topics. And so strategic deterrence is one of the special sections in this year's report, I think, because it's it's important. It's also, I think, of a particular interest to uh, DOD leadership. Um, but you also see a number of other special sections that are kind of unique this, this year as well. Um, a couple of them relate to personnel uh, developments. Um, in the PLA, uh, you have one section that talks about, you know, sort of perceived weaknesses or self-assessments um, of Chinese military leadership, um, that these guys still lack kind of the quality, the caliber of expertise. You have problems, lack of combat experience, et cetera. And so you have an interesting report there. You have another section that looks in particular at mobilization, recruitment, some of the important changes and reforms they've been making are uh, really to try to attract, um, develop, uh, cultivate, and retain uh, some of the talent that they're going to need going forward. Um, and I would just point to a, a very good report that the U.S.-China Commission put out back in November 2022 that covers a lot of this ground um, as well. But it's important, I think, because the China Mill Power Reports rarely touch really on personnel. Um, they're really more focused on capabilities. Um, in terms of some of the important global and regional developments um, going on this last year that the report touches on, you know, the biggest event, I think, was really in terms of Russia's uh, incursion into Ukraine and where China fits in. The report talks really at the strategic level how they're trying to sort of balance the relationship um, between Russia and Europe and the United States, the foreign policy angle. I think it was actually a bit of a missed opportunity, uh, however, for DOD, insofar as they really didn't talk about some of the lessons that the PLA uh, seems to be drawing on from the uh, from the war in Ukraine, uh, including the insight that wars are becoming more protracted, more difficult to win quickly. Um, and so I think there are some important lessons and insights uh, there. Um, they do talk about the um, uptick in coercive activities across the Taiwan Strait, uh, really kicking off around August 2022 with Nancy Pelosi's visit to the island and continuing into 2023 with Tsai Ing-wen's uh, transit visit to the United States. They do cover uh, China's uh, reaction and the U.S. Uh, response uh, to the high-altitude balloon that transited the United States last February. Good content there. 
Um, I think one of the more, more important insights from this year's report that really gets to sort of a modernizing but potentially more coercive uh, PLA is the revelation of quite a lo large number um, of dangerous, coercive, and risky uh, air intercepts by the PLA Air Force, by naval aviation units against U.S. Uh, and allied um, assets, um, especially in the air. There's some discussion of the maritime uh, recklessness as well from China. And it was um, coincided with the release of this report, um, the declassified um, publication of a number of videos and images uh, of dangerous uh, intercepts uh, by Chinese assets um, in the Western Pacific in the global commons. Um, and so I think that's really quite uh, concerning. Most recently, what we saw was the um, the very dangerous intercept by a Chinese jet against a U.S. B-52 in the South China Sea um, that seemed to be even closer and more dangerous than any of the other incidents uh, publicized by DOD recently. Um, and so I guess this kind of brings me to the last point, which is on U.S.-China military engagements. You know, certainly last year there was, you know, we were really at a low point. Um, a lot of um, visits, exchanges were canceled after the Pelosi visit. Um, and in particular, after Li Shangfu was appointed defense minister in March, he was sanctioned by the United States, so the Chinese really weren't willing to talk uh, to DOD because of that. Where we are now, I think, is potentially starting to reset the relationship. There's a little bit of good news um, insofar as Li Shangfu has disappeared, so the sanctions issue is moot at this point. Um, and there are also signs that the U.S.-China relationship more broadly is kind of starting to uh, warm up a bit. Um, and so I think this is potentially good for our military engagements uh, with the Chinese. We saw uh, recently, just a day or two ago at the Xiangshan Forum, uh, General Zhang Yoshia, despite delivering uh, quite the incendiary rhetoric on Taiwan, also mentioned uh, that you know he saw room for a reset of U.S.-China uh, military engagements. And so perhaps he needed to deliver that strong hawkish message in order to um, you know, find a convenient way to reset our relations um, uh, from a position of strength. Um, and so I thought that was a pretty important development, and hopefully we're going to be on a bit of a better trajectory um, here over the next uh, few months than we certainly have been over the last year or 18 months or so. Um, so let me uh, stop there and uh, and pause for uh, comments. Thank you, Joel. I think uh, we'll definitely return to you for a number of issues. Uh, I had definitely have a number of questions uh, with regard to what you mentioned, but let me turn to Ming Shu first and Rod, and then we will circle back with everyone for more Q and A and discussion. Uh, uh, Ming Shu, I know you're based in Taiwan, uh, and you're you're doing significant work at INDSR looking at how the PLA operates. From your perspective, uh, how is Taiwan's assessment of the PLA capabilities as well as PLA activities different? or similar to US Department of Defense assessments. And from your perspective, what is different, if anything, or new in terms of PLA activities against Taiwan? And I know you've also covered quite a bit on PLA leadership. What do you see as what's happening at the very top within the PLA leadership? Why was Li Shangfu removed and who might take Li Shangfu's uh, position? I think you're muted. Uh, okay, uh, good morning and good evening. And now I'm in Taiwan. Uh, I think I need to talk about uh, the Xiangfu first. Uh, we can see that most of the experts of the, uh, even in Taiwan, in the United States or international society, they are thinking about the Xiangfu resign or step down because of uh, the corruption. <clears throat> but we don't see any uh, big, big corruption example event for the Xiangfu. And how much how how much money he earned by the corruption? So I think everyone say corruption is the reason of the example is the resignation. But I think it was not the only factor. Um, at, because after Li Shangfu disappears, uh, China announced that it uh encouraged that the private sector uh in, individual to report uh corruption about the. PRA uh, armament system. Uh, I think they, that uh, PRA or, or uh, CCP uh, try to find evidence for Li Sangfu's uh, resignation or investigation rather than to involve uh, that uh, have uh, concrete evidence that Li Sangfu already uh, corruption. And 
I think uh, my point of view, I think there are two main reasons for Li Shangfu resignation. I think the first one is uh, we know that Li Shangfu had been to the vice commander of the uh, Rocky Force. We can see many senior general of Rocky Force a resignation of step down, including the commander, political commissar, uh, vice commander, vice uh, political commissar, or even chief of staff. Uh, uh, I think not only because of the leak, uh, because of clarified information, uh, leak from the Ross book uh, talking about the Rocky Falls, I think it's not so simple. I think it's because of uh, Rocky Falls, many have big trouble, maybe uh, system development, uh, because I also see some um, uh, information from the uh, internet, say uh, Rocky Falls, build up many uh, well of uh, long range missile, but it's empty. So there's a big uh, corruption for the Rocky Force. So why Xi Jinping is so angry? I think the first one, the first reason is uh, because of uh, when he is, uh, was the uh, uh, commander of Rocky Force and Rocky Force have big trouble right now. Uh, the second is uh, uh, we can see that uh, Li Shangfu speech in Shangri-La dialogue. Uh, you can compare with the Zhang Yuxia in the Shangshan Warren. You can feel that their attitude uh, is uh, very different because Li Shangfu just like uh, uh, a very kind, uh, older, and 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 when he talking about United States is not so hawkish. So um, so many experts talking about Li Shangfu say. Uh, he obeyed uh, Xi Jinping's order about invade Taiwan in the Xi Jinping right now take a risky action to invade Taiwan because Li Shangfu very understand the capability uh, between United uh, State uh, military and PRA. So he he did not agree. So Xi Jinping feel he is a uh, uh, so-called Wei Zhan afraid to fight with the United States. So we can see why Zhang Yuxia in the Shangshan Warren uh, said so hawkish uh, word uh, to Taiwan and to United States. We can see that uh, they might be the reason. Uh, and in terms of the successor candidate, uh, we can judge him from the arrangement of the Shangshan Warren because uh, we can see that two vice chairmen uh, Zhang Yuxia and He Weidong uh, both joined uh, the Shangshan Warren, but uh, Zhang Yuxia received the big country uh, uh, Minister of Defense like uh, Russia, uh, Belarus, but He Weidong is uh, re receive and accept the small countries uh, Minister of Defense. And we can see that the video, Liu Zhenli, when opening uh, a remark, uh, Liu Zhenli is said beside uh, Shoigu, uh, uh, Russia as the Minister of Defense. So I think that Liu Zhenli might be the next uh, Minister of Defense. But we know that in the uh, uh, PRL system, they have a government system and a party system. Government system is the Minister of Defense and uh, a member of the uh, State Council. But uh, the so-called Quan Guo Ren Da Chang Wei Hui, the People's Party uh, Standing Committee, uh, just finished the meeting to decide that Qing Gang uh, stepped down from a uh, state council uh, member and also Li Shangfu, but cannot uh, uh, pass that uh, Liu Zhenli to be a new uh, minister of defense of the new member of state council. Maybe we'll wait to the next year on uh, March, just like uh, Li Shangfu. Li Shangfu to be a member of CMC in the uh, uh, 20 party congress but his a uh, new job of uh, minister of defense it's till to this year uh so-called Lianghui march and then pass so i think liu zhenli maybe in Da sanzong Quanhui were to be the member of cmc number four but his uh, new job of uh, minister of defense will pass uh, next year march so i think uh not he weidong because he weidong position is number three i don't think he will uh, to be number four Minister of Defense. So Liu Zhenli uh, right now is already prepared to be the Minister of the Defense. Uh, we can see from the Shangshan Warren. And then uh, from the new report, uh, CMPR, uh, uh, Bonnie asked me that uh, 
uh, new or, or, or compared to United States. Uh, we can see uh, just like uh, uh, Joe say, uh, because this report is focused on 2022. 2022 only uh, the big drill or exercise uh, because of uh, uh, August uh, policy visit Taiwan. But we can see because that drill and exercise because of a 20 party Congress is coming. So PRA need to organize a big exercise uh, to de deter or to warning the United States or Taiwan. So you can see that uh, this year when uh, uh, Taiwan President Tsai Ing-wen transit uh, United States, uh, PRA also organized exercise, but less scale than uh, last year. And, and, and no life fi exercise, I think that the main uh, reason. But we need to, it's worth noting that exercise recently that the CCP uh, deliberately announced uh, those are carried out in the low profile. For example, uh, we can see near Taiwan, near Maju, the Da Cheng Wan exercise. Uh, they had an amphibious landing exercise in Da Cheng Wan, Da Cheng Bay, uh, across Taiwan in September, and was populated uh, to the outside world. Uh, this may be avoid in, impacting. Uh, we know that next year, January, uh, Taiwan have a presidential election. So I think uh, China is trying to not so open to let the public know that the exercise is focused on uh, Taiwan uh, because of political factor, because of Taiwan's election. So it, uh, it's better that the new leader of Rocky Force uh, was also performed because the new leader of Rocky Force they think, okay, I'm the new commander and political commissar. Uh, we know uh, very good and well performance uh, to the Xi Jinping, uh, but low profile. Uh, and uh, about the Xiangshan Lun Tan, uh, mentioned before about Zhang Yuxia's hawkish uh, attitude, I think the Xiangshan Warren was originally for Warren for Military United Front, front uh, inviting many countries, different ministers uh, from different countries to show that uh, China uh, military strength and promote uh, regional cooperation. Uh, it was originally an annual uh, gathering for military experts and scholars from many different countries and talking about uh, peace issue or regional cooperation issue. However, uh, this year, Shangshan Warren has attracted attention due to the uh, personnel uh, problem uh, caused by the Li Xiangfu disappearance and the substantial purge of the Rocky Force and the development of a uh, <clears throat> submarine accident and event. The first is the personnel issue of Minister of Defense. Uh, we can see uh, two vice chairmen uh, uh, join and responsible for the keynote speech this time. But right now, we're not confirmed that who is the next. Uh, maybe Liu Zhenli, just I mentioned. Uh, secondly, uh, we can see that Zhang Yuxia criticized the United States against the uh, uh, CCP Russian policy. Uh, but you can see right now, or uh, recently, Wang Yi visited the United States and tried to uh, make or urge, uh, uh, encourage the United States uh, when Xi Jinping and Biden meeting in the United States and make good atmosphere, a good uh, uh, feeling uh, when Xi Jinping visit. Uh, United States, but CMC, but in Shangshan Luntan, uh, Zhang Yuxia make a hawkish attitude to the United States. So a little bit contradiction. Uh, Wang Yi, uh, maybe a dog, and Zhang Yuxia is hawk, but which one is real? But you can see that because of uh, Li Keqiang dead, and then if uh, military, if PRA, inside PRA, they have a different uh, action, a different response about the Li Keqiang maybe will be the uh, factor that make Xi Jinping will not visit United States because of uh, Li Keqiang deaths and prevent the chaos uh, and then prevent that the military because right now there are some personnel position not confirmed. So I think these two factors will influence Xi Jinping uh, visit United States or not. Thank you. Great, thank you, Mingxu. Uh, I do want also to bring in Ron to 
discuss some of these issues that you've uh, touched on, but maybe more from the U.S. perspective, because I think, Misha, you are sharing with us both your assessment as well as some of the discussions and that are occurring in Taiwan right now. So, Rod, from your perspective, given all that was discussed, um, do you see the PLA as less stable now than before? And is given the personnel problems that Ming Shu pointed out, is she still confident in the PLA leadership? And what are the implications if he's not confident or less confident? Of course, we would lo love for you to weigh in on do you think Liu Denli might be the next defense minister? Um, so let me just turn the floor to you to, for you to jump in on these issues or any of the other issues that uh, Joel touched on. Sure. Yeah. So, on and getting to your first question about does is the PLA less stable as a result of of whether it's Li Shangfu or or the other plethora of alleged rocket force corruption or suicide to avoid corruption incidents? Um, I. The bottom line is I would probably say no. Uh, I think there's a lot of rumors about we, we ultimately don't have a totally clear picture of what happened. Uh, I think the consensus view, as as uh, Ming Shu mentioned, was this is probably corruption related. There's a couple of, of tie or threads that sort of tie it all together. Um, you know, the the one that most people point towards is a release or a sort of press release looking for the PLA, looking for information about corruption related issues dating back to, I believe is August, 2017 in the equipment development system, which happens to coincide with Li Shangfu's tenure as the equipment development department director and the coincidental removal or alleged removal of multiple rocket force leaders within the, 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 uh, at the senior echelons, what would constitute the party committee for the rocket force all points towards probably some rocket force related corruption issue. Uh, not surprising. There was a lot of expansion going on during that time period, both on the nuclear and conventional side, as, as Joel highlighted uh, that the CMPR talked about when there's a lot of expansion going on, a lot of acquisitions goes on, a lot of money is running around. It's, it's hard. It's hard to avoid some, some corruption occurring. But that gets to the, the the crux of my point that I don't think this is inherently less stable than it was before. I think we have to remember that the PLA used to be a, a egregiously corrupt system. And Xi Jinping, you know, we can talk about how anti-corruption campaigns are targeted to reduce political rivals against Xi Jinping, but in the PLA, it's really about corruption. These are these are people who were in it to make money, not to be war fighters. And when Xi Jinping comes in and clears house, the twos and three stars in the US system, three and four star equivalents, that's the bottom of the barrel that you're left with, right? You you went through a system, you cleaned house where corruption was the norm. The people that you have left aren't not corrupt. They're just the least bad option you had left at those senior echelons. It, and so it's hard to expect, I would argue, it's hard to expect them to not be tempted again to, to either get back into corruption or remain corrupt and just try to hide it a little better. So in, in that sense, it's hard to, it's hard to go down from stability. Uh, so I don't think they necessarily went down. Now, this gets to sort of your second question of, is she still confident in the PLA? One, I don't think she was ever confident in the PLA. I, I suspect we don't have the same problem where, where allegedly in the Russian system, you have the Russian military telling Putin everything is fine and Putin may be believing it. I think PLA, or I think she knows that when the PLA tells him something, that's not the entire truth or or he needs to find out he needs to do a little bit more of his own fact finding through trusted agents or other more formal mechanisms to sort of scrutinize what's going on so i don't think for a moment pla uh, xi jinping had confidence in the pla before this corruption scheme was unveiled i don't think you know did it go down in terms of confidence yeah probably a, 
a fair amount. Uh, I think Xi Jinping is probably quite frustrated that approaching a decade of anti-corruption efforts has apparently yielded not a whole lot to show for it because people are still apparently willing to engage in corrupt activities. Uh, not in the recent, you know, not this year, but one or two years ago, there was a whole slew of senior officials in the defense industry that were arrested for corruption issues. So I think this is probably a point of frustration, but only reinforces Xi's continued lack of confidence in the PLA and their ability to do what he's asking them to do. Um, so as, as far as Liu Zhen Li is for, for the next MINDEF, my intuition is, is probably not, uh, in, in, if I were to be a senior PLA officer and I was appointed to be the head of the joint staff department and therefore on the CMC, and you told me my, you know, one of my fellow CMC members was just sacked the minister of national defense and I'm to take his job. I think you're demoting me. This is, I, I believe this is technically a demotion that would, if it happened, it would technically be a demotion from a political side. Uh, I think from a protocol order perspective, the CMC Joint Staff Department uh, head is after is third or fourth in protocol order. Regardless, the the uh, Minister of National Defense, I believe, is last, uh, or certainly below the Joint Staff Department head. So, in that sense, the Joint Staff Department, the head of the Joint Staff Department, has immense amounts of power, even after the reorg, where it's not these four behemoth general departments. Uh, the Minister of National Defense, our whole, as a U.S., our whole sticking point is the Minister of the National Defense is a toothless position. And why would I, as Liu Jin Li, want to go from one, the most powerful operational sort of authority in the PLA, second to the Vice Chairman Xi Jinping, to someone who does foreign affairs work and some other random sort of state council level functions? I have no idea. I wouldn't want the job if my current job was joint staff department. So that that those are my takes on the sort of leadership thing going on. Uh, as far as the CMPR developments and some other developments, I'd like to sort of take this time and break it up in, into two things uh, of things that we're seeing that that the CMPR is highlighting it or things adjacent to the CMPR are highlighting. But perhaps more importantly, I would like to highlight some things that are not being touched on and I think do need to be on people's radars that that are occurring within the PLA. So getting first to what is being talked about, um, I think it's it's sort of it's natural for us right now to look at the PLA and say, this is a learning organization. How are they adapting to the world around them? And and the CMPR sort of highlights greater involvement PLA involvement in statecraft, tracking, understand that. But how is the PLA looking at the world around them and, and trying to ingest that information and process it? I think a lot of attention was paid back during the beginning and still to, to present day, although not as much, about PLA views of the Ukraine, uh, Ukraine conflict and what they might be learning from that. And, and now I think the knee-jerk reaction would be, let's look at, let's look at PLA reactions or views of the Israeli activity, Israeli operations in in Gaza, and what what might what lessons might they be taking out of that? Um, the, I think it's good to look at what the PLA might be exposed to. I'm not saying we shouldn't do those things, but this gets to one of the things that I think we see a little bit of the CMPR talking about sort of new developments in in PLA regulations or legislation, as the PLA likes to call it. But it's important to remember that even though the PLA is coming out with this new salvo of things like the Joint Operations Outline, uh, new training, military training and evaluation, outline for military training and evaluation, you've got all this new stuff, this doctrine and policy coming out of the PLA to adapt it to this new modern force that Joel outlined. The PLA took somewhere in the neighborhood, best case scenario 10, worst case scenario on some of those 20 years to update doctrine. That's, that's a really painfully long process to ingest information, process it, and disseminate it force wide. Now, the PLA does 
also encourage forces to do sort of grassroots level development of TTP tactics, techniques, and procedures and learn lessons that way. But those are going to be heavily non-standardized. In your mileage may vary where one brigade may have lessons learned and they say, hey, this is actually a really good idea. Maybe we should be using, you know, quadcopters this way. But unless if AMS, Academy of Military Sciences, or the Joint Staff Department, or the Military Training Management Department is issuing guidance to do this. There's not actually a really clear mechanism, as far as I can tell, despite all this modernization, that, that indicates the PLA is getting better at lessons learned. The United States Department of Defense, each of the services has a dedicated organization called Lessons Learned. Their whole purpose is to look at what's going on in the world and try to ingest that and put it into U.S. doctrine. The PLA doesn't appear to have a good mechanism to do that. In fact, they talk about wanting to do doctrine development better. But as far as I can tell, I don't think they've gotten there yet because as recent as 2022, they talk about needing to actually modernize the what they call the legislative and legal process of updating PLA policy. So. I, I think we have to be really careful in in saying, okay, the PLA is out there watching things. They're writing about things, whether it's in PLA Daily or in China Military Science, whatever whatever your go-to source is, that's fine. But you have to be careful about how how is the PLA actually taking away that lesson? And is the lesson the same across the PLA? Because if they're doing grassroots development, I at one combined arms brigade in Eastern Theater Command might say, yeah, okay, this makes a lot of sense. Maybe out west in you know Western Theater Command, Xinjiang Military District, you're like, this 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 makes no sense to me. We don't do urban operations. We're operating at high altitudes in excess of ten thousand feet. None of this matters to me. So your mileage may vary on how much the PLA as an institution writ large is picking it up until AMS, Academy of Military Sciences, or Joint Staff Department, or somewhere at the CMC level promulgates it. Um, now to very briefly, I'm going to use my tiny amount of time left. I do want to highlight some things that I don't think are being talked about that we do need to address or we need to think about. One is, we, as Joel highlighted, we're seeing growth in the PLA. The problem is, where is that, how is that growth occurring? As Joel mentioned, seeing platforms is great, but what about the personnel? Uh, we are seeing indications that the PLA is no longer able to just add more stuff. Like as they acquire more weapon systems, they appear to be somewhat resource limited in needing to pull resources away from other parts of the PLA. And I think the classic example that I'll point to here is those three silo fields out in the middle of China with those 300 plus ICBMs those personnel numbers didn't just come out of nowhere. They got taken away from the army. Like they disbanded an army unit and said, you guys are now rocket force. And that's how they manned it, which suggests to me that they have some resourcing problems. So as we see these larger submarine numbers, these larger missile numbers, these larger surface vessel numbers, greater numbers of aircraft, where are all of these billets coming from? Um, and it seems to be not just purely, purely, expanding the size of the active duty force. There's probably some of that, but there's probably some trade-offs. And there's this additional angle where it looks like the PLA is actually uh, massively increasing the size of its civilian. We used to just not care about civilian cadre. They were such a tiny percentage. They're recruiting like 30,000 people a year now. This is that up from like 10 when they first started this program. This is a significant increase. And that might be how they're freeing up Billets normally held by active duty with those guys. The last one that I'll highlight is PLA being used as statecraft. They're thinking about it, I think, more than CMPR acknowledges or talks about. Uh, we know actually that they thought about, they either thought about or actually did deploy a limited number of PLA personnel to support evacuation operations in, in, the, in Ukraine. I, I, that's generally not common knowledge, but they either considered the operation and had PLA operational forces trained to do it, or they actually sent them. Strategic Support Force regularly deploys communications personnel abroad for purposes I don't know. But this is stuff that isn't the counter piracy task force. That's not Djibouti. That's not some of the high visibility exercises. The PLA is out there probably more than we 
we and it's not even space tracking. The PLA is out there more than we really acknowledge, and I think we really appreciate. So I think we need to really look at how much PLA stuff is out there, and what are they actually doing to achieve party objectives. So I'll leave it there. Um, looking forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, Rod. Uh, before I open this up for um, Q&A, as well as some of the questions that were sent beforehand, I did want to turn the floor briefly to Joel for you to weigh in on the leadership. So we had Ming Shi weighing in on Liu Jianli, Joel saying not likely Liu Jianli, I'm uh, sorry, uh, Rod saying not likely Liu Jianli, but not saying who it will, will be. So Joel, what are your thoughts? <laughs> Well, we don't, we don't know. I'm going to take the safe answer. I mean, the rumor is that Leo Genli will be the defense minister. Nothing's been announced. I agree with making sure that we're going to have to wait until the third plenum. We don't even know when the third plenum is going to be held, but that would be the opportunity to get Li Shang Fu off the party committee. His name is still on the website, so they're going on a process where you can have the National People's Congress Standing Committee take him off the state uh, Central Military Commission, but they don't have the authority even to remove his name from the website of the party Central Military Commission. Um, so things will be revealed at the third plenum that should be coming up here in the next couple of weeks if history is a guide. Whether it's Leo Jen Lee, whether it's someone else, we really don't know. If it is Leo Jen Lee, then there is the question of an opening in the Joint Staff Department. And the rumor there is potentially Chang Dingchio coming up from the Air Force, which would be a fascinating win for the Air Force, which isn't represented on the CMC right now. Um, but again, instead of making, you know, sort of a prediction, I think, you know, we will know the answer very soon. And, um, you know, the question is, is that someone who Xi Jinping is going to trust more than Li Shangfu? And there, I think really the jury's jury's quite quite still out on that. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, so there are a couple of topics I want to pull out before we go to some of the questions uh, that were submitted online. One is, and I think uh, all three of you touched on this a, a bit, is are we seeing uh, China's readiness uh, decrease at all, uh, given what's happening, both at the personnel at the very top, we're, we're still likely to see, as all three of you are saying, some uh, empty positions remain, so at least for a couple of weeks, if not longer. Um, so is that impacting China's readiness? And how do we link that to what we're seeing in terms of the recent spike in uh, risky encounters that a number of you have touched on? Uh, how, how does, is this, are these spike in uh, risky encounters at all linked to the lack of top leadership or are they completely separate, um, separate activities that show a more assertive China? Just how do we interpret everything that's going on? Um, I think before since the panel went from Joel Mingxi to Ra, maybe I'll, I'll direct this question to Rod first, and we can uh, go to Mingxi and Joel if you want to jump in. Yeah, sure. I I don't think it's I don't think the personnel stuff is related to the increase in in provocative activities. One, I don't know how we don't have a total we don't have a a perfect data set uh, publicly available, so it's it's hard to say. We are observing in out in this world more provocative PRC activities, but it's hard to say whether there is a real world increase or we're just talking about and seeing it more. But I, whether there's an increase or not, I don't think it's related. I, I think those are very directed. My whole pitch is we can call them dangerous and unsafe. That's a true statement. They're dangerous and unsafe encounters and provocative, but that's kind of the point. Um, the PLA isn't out there to be safe. The PLA is out there conducting confrontational military operations to deter our message to U.S. partners and allies that it's not pleased. And it happens to believe that this is within acceptable risk tolerances. I think that's that's the PLA's take, and it's being sanctioned at the, it's being directed at the highest level. So I think it's unrelated. Uh, as far as readiness, uh, I don't I don't think it has a massive impact on most operational units. Um, I, it's hard to say exactly because I suspect if a large portion of the rocket force was straight, was strafed out or stripped out for corruption issues, that suggests that there are lower echelon guys that we're just not seeing. If there are lower echelon guys being taken out as well, that probably has a greater impact. But day-to-day -day PLA operational readiness, I 
I on the conventional or nuclear side, I doubt is is affected. the The rocket force headquarters is ultimately in charge of man train man train equipped functions, but the system is PLA systems are designed to be robust. Whether it's administrative functions or operational functions, they're designed to absorb losses of the entire party committee of a unit by having a backup or having processes to fill that hole. I, you know, maybe some minor blips here and there, but I don't think there's anything major long-term that that would sort of substantively move the meter if it would, if you will. Thank you. Uh, Misha and Joel, did you want to weigh in too? Okay. Uh, we suppose if Xi Jinping as a, uh, every general, are you ready to fight uh, in Taiwan Strait against the United States? I think every general say, we, we are always ready. Uh, but different general, maybe different thinking. If you uh, if Xi Jinping at He Weidong, maybe uh, he's the hokey general and then he's the commander of uh, uh, Eastern Sea the Command. Uh, Wang Haijiang, Western Sea the Command. Uh, maybe the two general will say, we are ready. But for Rocky Force general, com commander or, or commissar, uh, if Xi Jinping asked them, of course, uh, period, they say, oh, we are ready. But how, how to fight with what system you can fight with or against United States? So a little bit different uh, in political, okay, we are ready. But actually uh, their uh, operational strategy or their operational prepare or readiness, I don't think they're already ready because it's not the surprise attack. It's not the short-term war. It will be the long war. We know that uh, like from last year, uh, Xi Jinping already ordered that uh, the uh, province, uh, military region, uh, now we need to prepare a long war, mobilization, food and personnel, so China right now, because of lesson learned from the Ukraine war, it already prepared a long war. But I don't think right now China is already be ready for a long war. Uh, and then I think uh, uh, another thing is uh, uh, for Xi Jinping, uh, if he very angry about that uh, final result of the Taiwan election, and then, okay, PLA, you, you need to invade Taiwan because uh, Taiwan were, were, were independent. I don't think Maybe PLA will follow this order, but how and when uh, were the point? And if someone can uh, give a Xi Jinping suggestion, so oh, now it is not good timing. So Xi Jinping need a reason, need to make his word uh, more legitimacy. If Taiwan not uh, announce a, a, a jury's uh, de facto, uh, the jury's uh, Taiwan independent, I think that, that China right now is not ready because the gap uh, between United States and PLA is huge. Maybe I think, uh, maybe different systems have different results, maybe 10 to 15 years, uh, but we know that PLA right now, they have more uh, uh, missile, uh, middle chain missile or hybrid uh, missile, uh, but in the aircraft carrier capability, in Air Force and Bomber, and even uh, the, the Army Marine Corps, uh, I think the gap is uh, maybe 10 or 10, 15 years. Uh, if Xi Jinping ordered PLA to fight, of course, PLA need to follow this his order. But how and how long, how to win were the big problem for the PLA. Thank you, Misha. I think you're highlighting a couple of things. One is that if Xi Jinping asks his, his commanders, as we were discussing earlier, he might not get the he might get the politically correct assessment, but not necessarily yeah. the most unbiased assessment. And maybe and that might differ from China's actual capabilities. The question is, will Xi Jinping know what those capabilities are? But maybe that goes to what Rod and Joel we were talking about earlier, which is lack of confidence in the PLA to begin with. So he has to have some doubt. Um, Joel, let me bring in you into this conversation about readiness, um, but also linked to what China may assess uh, is happening on the international stage with um, what we're seeing is more U.S. involvement, uh, both in the Middle East as well as Ukraine. Do you think that at all impacts how China, how China thinks that it may be uh, offered a window of opportunity in any sense? 
Well, I think, you know, just briefly on first on the question of, you know, readiness, you can kind of play it both ways. You know, you have this higher tempo of operational activity. Uh, this is good for the pilots who are getting more experience uh, flying out um, into the Taiwan Strait, et cetera. It's not so great for the aircraft uh, that are getting a lot of wear and tear. So what's the balance there? I think, you know, with respect to your question on, you know, is this a sort of moment of opportunity for the PLA? Is this going to make them more warlike? I don't think so. I think, you know, they per sort of perceived that the United States was tied down in the Middle East for the last 20 years, and yet they didn't go to war uh, for that entire period of time. Um, I think they see the U.S. as peripherally involved in Ukraine, uh, which is the fact we're doing training, we're selling some important or providing some important munitions there. With respect to the Eastern Med, you have um, you know a certain level of readiness, but not really engagement. But this is all less than what we were doing in Iraq and Afghanistan for many years. Um, so I, I don't think any of this changes. You know the fundamental cost benefit on going to war against Taiwan is that you have a possibility, if not a likelihood, of U.S. intervention combined with massive economic you know problems that would you know just layer on top of an already bad economy. Um, I mean, there's a lot of sort of questions there. I don't think this is going to push the needle um, from a close call to something more towards a warlike behavior. Um, it's a factor. It's something they would consider. They probably like to see us bogged down again, um, but I don't think this is going to make them more warlike necessarily. Thank you. So we have a number of questions from the audience asking about uh, general PLA capability, including if the United States is capable of defeating the PLA, is the United States ready for a war in the Taiwan Strait? And linked again also to questions about US, uh, the United States Navy moving 25 to 30 percent of its operational force fleet to the Middle East theater. I know this panel is very much focused on China's capability, so maybe I can flip that around. Are you seeing, are any of you seeing assessments from the PLA saying that they view the United States as less ready and less willing to defend our allies and partners in the Indo-Pacific region or any assessments along those lines? I'll I'll take the first shot. I, I'm not aware of anything. Uh, I, I also, I don't think the PLA or the CCP looks at what U.S. readiness looks like and says, hey, today is the day that we're going to invade Taiwan because I think U.S. readiness is low or is, is low enough. Even, even if we hypothetically said that the PLA one day said, I think I can beat the United States with relatively low cost, it's still a really costly endeavor. And if you as a CCP think you can still achieve peaceful seizure of Taiwan, then why burn through a lot of cost in invasion? It's not, this isn't some, I wake up one day and I think I can do it, so I'm going to pull the trigger. Because when you pull the trigger, you're also, as I put it, you're putting bullets in both of your feet and all those other national objectives you've set for yourself. It's just not worth it unless if things are really going sideways on as far as Taiwan is concerned. So I, I don't think I don't think that's how they're looking at the problem. Yeah, uh, but but I will be next. Uh, I see, we know that China have a two hand strategy, uh, not only focus on the uh, hard hand military, or focus on the soft hand uh, peaceful unification. Uh, I, I mentioned before that right now uh, in Taiwan we have a present election campaign right now. So maybe uh, China will depend on the peaceful main, uh, try to maybe uh, next election will produce a pen a pro China uh, president maybe. But uh, PLA right now already prepare if uh, some uh, uh, situation happen, they don't want to see. They need to act PLA to be prepared if Taiwan straight breaking company and PLA already prepare, but uh, you can see that the capability uh, gap between the United States and China. I think uh, when China invade Taiwan, uh, in my uh, personal point of view, I think three timing. The first one is, uh, of course, uh, if the United States uh, uh, abandon Taiwan and pub publicly, publicly uh, maybe uh, China think uh, there's good timing. And then uh, we will use hard hand, soft hand uh, to force Taiwan to invade Taiwan. Uh, the second timing is uh, when PRA uh, full of confidence 
and believe they can destroy and defeat the United States, and then they will invade Taiwan. But right now, we mentioned about, we, we're talking about the prepare. I don't think right now, PRA already prepare to win or to defeat a uh, United States military, even part of the United States military right now uh, focus on Middle East affair. The third timing is uh, uh, Taiwan's uh, defense repair or Taiwan people's way of fighting. Uh, you can see that uh, after uh, President Tsai uh, got the power, uh, our uh, compulsory system uh, extend from four months to one year, and we already buy many advanced weapon system. And we also uh, met and already completed our first IDS. So you can see right now Taiwan is trying to uh, stronger and let our defense capability more stronger and uh, more advanced. I think we'll let the PLA think about, okay, uh, today is the best time or maybe tomorrow or maybe 2027 or after 2027. But and, and, and after that, we can see that the United States military power also stronger uh, than before. Thank you. Thank you. Joel, I wanted to, uh, I know you want to jump on this one too, but I also wanted to ask you about uh, U.S.-China mill mill. You mentioned earlier that you saw that, that the Xiangshan Forum was an example of uh, a, a positive direction of U.S.-China mill mill. How do you see, how do you see that evolving in the next couple of months, particularly as we're also seeing uh, the United States and China um, see more incidents between each other. You are seeing dynamics in the in the South China Sea with the Philippines. How how do those incidents, if at all, impact mill mill? Or do you think they're they are not going to impact the, the mill mill engagements? Well, critic critics will say that mill mill is a total sideshow because the PLA is doing coercive things. And you know, if you talk to them, then it really doesn't make any difference because they're doing this for strategic reasons. Um, I would say that there is still the chance of accidents. I mean, there is a very serious chance of accidents. Um, and if we don't have a way to quickly communicate and to find ways to either avoid those in the first place or to de-escalate from them, um, then things can quickly spiral. And really, that was my perception of the B-52 incident. It wasn't, it was, you know, yes, they were sending a signal, but they were also doing so in an unprofessional way at nighttime within 10 feet. I mean, this is this is very dangerous stuff. Um, and if you have no solid communications and mechanisms, then I think for both sides, there's an interest in being able to handle to get around what are our perceptions, what is standard practice, how are we going to try to, you know, get an off ramp to that if things ever came to it. Um, so I do think there are prospects for it, because both sides have an interest um, in, in those things. Now, what could this look like? Well, it could look like resuming uh, the three uh, exchanges that were canceled back in August 2022. It could mean further uh, ministerial level dialogues, which are are now possible because Li Shang Fu is out. Um, it could be some kind of a deliverable at the APEC a summit. Um, if whether or not Xi Jinping actually attends it next month, um, there could be some further announcement. I don't think we're going to go back to the Obama administration's level of you know very expansive, in-depth engagements at all levels of the PLA. But I do think at least at those senior levels, um, we're likely to see some level of resuscitation, again, because both sides want it. Thank you. Uh, so in the interest of time, we'll need to wrap up. I did want to go across each of the panelists to see if there's anything you want to add in terms of whether uh, we missed any major topics related to the PLA or points that you wanted to emphasize in terms of watching PLA developments moving forward. So let me go in, in a somewhat different order. So Ming Shi to you first, and then we'll go to Rod, and then we'll go to Joe. Joel. Um, oh, I'm the, yes, I'm the first. Uh, would you please uh, repeat your question? Uh, I just want to uh, give you a, a minute or so to say if there was anything that you wanted to emphasize for the audience as we wrap up this panel. Uh, okay. Uh, yes, uh, we can see that uh, many audience uh, from from their Q and A uh, chart. Uh, the uh, concern about that uh, is uh, China uh, already prepare long war, or China have a PRA have a uh, operational plan to Taiwan uh, scenario, I will say yes. But for a long war, because uh, we know that PLA have a guerrilla tradition. They they have full of uh, uh, military culture or tradition about uh, how to win uh, from a weak side to the strong side. So they have all this experience. So the long war to them is not a big uh, problem. But 
uh, because of uh, Taiwan's trend. But how to move their power from China, mainland China to Taiwan is a big problem. Uh, if Taiwan has strong uh, a, a Navy capability, and then uh, international society will help Taiwan to break through the blockade, I think it's more difficult for to PRA to invade uh, Taiwan and cross Taiwan Strait. Thank you. Thank you. Rod and Joel, do any of you want to weigh in on some of the questions regarding nuclear? Just really fast, 30 seconds each, if possible. <laughs> Sure. Uh, Bonnie, I guess what I was going to add, because you mentioned it at the outset, was the story. It's been sort of overtaken by other events, um, but this, the reported submarine uh, incident from about a month ago or so, I was just going to touch on this. Um, I think it's an interest, it was an interesting case because it started as a social media rumor, was then picked up by the tabloid press, and then made its way into the mainstream press. Um, and so I think it's an example of how unconfirmed information can kind of quickly get into the public sphere. Um, my perception so far is that there really wasn't anything to it. No government has officially or really even informally weighed in on this topic. It doesn't seem to have been happened, but it is an example of how we need to be very uh, careful about information, um, especially in the Chinese a context where things like this, I think, can be believable uh, precisely because they tend not to want to admit sort of technical failures, technical glitches, problems uh, that they're facing. And so in the absence of sort of official information from them, you know, the idea of some kind of a problem or a scandal or a rumor, it's very easy for us to believe these things. Um, but I think, you know, as journal journalists and professionals, we have to be very careful in dealing with this sort of information because sometimes people have agendas in spreading them and sometimes it's actually not true. Thank you, Joel. Uh, Rod, any final words from you? Yeah, I'll, I'll take a very quick shot at the nuclear stuff. Um, I, I am immensely pleased, if I recall correctly, uh, that the CMPR finally called out that China has, as far as we can tell, never actually said explicitly that they have a a minimal deterrence posture on the nuclear side. They always call it the minimum amount required sufficient for national or sort of national requirements or defense requirements or security requirements. That's the, that they call it limited deterrence is sometimes called medium scale deterrence. And if you look at their definitions, it's just really hedgy. We'll have as many nukes as we need to be safe and not anymore. But I would argue no country acquires more nukes than they think is actually necessary for meeting national security requirements. This is called excessive spending, and most countries don't do that, arguably. At least they don't think they do that. Um, so I'm really, really pleased that they did that. But besides that, we don't know, right? China deliberately maintains strategic nuclear ambiguity, and they say that that's because it makes nuclear posture changes or providing transparency in crises that increases deterrence value of that. Because if you provide transparency now in steady state, then you get no bang for your buck. Uh, you do get bang for your buck when you do it, when you feel like you're going up the nuclear ladder during a crisis or during a conflict. So until that happens, they're going to remain ambiguous and say we'll have as many nukes as we want. And we will maintain a launch on warning posture. And that may or may not go away. So I, I, I think largely the answer is we don't know on nukes because they're not going to tell us. And I hate to put it this way, some guy who works at some think tank in China or works at, you know, is a professor at Tsinghua, unless if you work for the Rocket Force or the CMC Joint Operations Command or Command Center, I don't trust your views on nuclear deterrence as authoritative. I want it freely authoritative, and they just deliberately don't tell us. Well, thank you very much, Rod, Joel, and Ming Shu. That shows the difficulty of analyzing the PLA in general, the last set of comments. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us. My apologies that we went four minutes over, but we were trying to address more of the questions from the audience. Um, I want to give you thanks again to our excellent panelists, and thank you for joining us. Thank you.